Hello, Booktube. Sometimes the stars present themselves in a once in a lifetime alignment. <laughs> and that has happened on Booktube. For the first time ever, all four of the four bookmen of the apocalypse, the OGBG, the OGeezer book group, are all doing library tours at the same time. <laughs> there's Todd's Bursting Bookcase, there's Jason Harrigan, there's Mark Richardson, and there's yours truly, all doing library tours at the same time. Will your TBRs survive? <laughs> Will your Amazon wish list recover? I don't think so. <laughs> and I'm just going to continue with mine. We're doing the east wall of this outer room uh, while it's still warm enough to do that out here. <laughs> and we are doing the east wall's entire history. Uh, and it's just three bookcases lined against each other. What I would like is if it were six bookcases, three and then three on top, so the whole wall were bookcases. And sooner or later, that will happen. Uh, as, of, as of now, there are a lot of books that are stacked vertically, or stacked horizontally, so that uh, they're not on shelves the way books should be. <laughs> and the reason that we are so egregiously backlit today is because we're at the very end uh, of the... We're, we're all the way to starboard <laughs> on, on the top shelf here of this last bookcase, which means there's nowhere for me to put the camera over here. I don't have a tripod or anything, so so uh, you have to put up with a little bit of backlighting. I figure it's not going to get any better in the course of the day. Uh, so we're just going to do this last stack, uh, and then we'll be done. And I will most certainly, in addition to leaving links for anything that in here that I have written about, I will also most certainly leave links to the other epic library tours that are happening right now. <laughs> they, they are best when watched together. My library tour is Redo. Uh, Mark Richardson has also just embarked on a redo of his own library tour. Uh, two years ago when he started his channel, he the, one of the first things he did was make a library tour in endless variety. I, had, I was drooling in envy of it just watching those videos. Since then, I have actually seen this library, and it is even more, it's even more incredible than it looks on camera. And of course, the, the neat thing about watching his library redo is how much more comfortable he is on camera. It's, it's it immediately obvious that, that this is someone who has made tons and tons of video, has, you know, thousands of viewers. That, that's, <laughs> so I will leave links to everybody. These library tours are ongoing. <laughs> we still have a huge amount more books to do. Don't think we can finish this year, but we'll give it a try. Uh, and like I said, I know for sure that as soon as I finish this library tour, someone is going to say, start over again. <laughs> do it all over again. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, the first book here I think we saw recently. This is a recent... I, I got it when it first came out, and I got it again when it first came out in paperback. I got rid of both of those. And uh, I found this again as a used book, and uh, I really liked it. I think it's important. I think it's an important book, so I wanted to have it. This is Peter Baker's book, Days of Fire, about Bush and Cheney in the White House and their um, functional slash dysfunctional relationship. It's, it's uh, for a brief while there, I toyed with the idea of amassing a library on the George W. Bush administration, but uh, I, I guess, I guess that the, the toxins haven't leached out of that period yet. Because it doesn't, it doesn't feel right to do in the way that it does, for instance, with the Reagan administration, <clears throat> which is every bit as important, uh, but where there's an element of, of buffoonery that has that has leached into it. I was angry about it at the time, but uh, yeah, at the time I was writing editorials, blistering editorials, sarcastic editorials. I had a large section of my reading public that did not even understand that I was being sarcastic. Uh, fortunately, my editor did, but uh, uh, thinking at the time, an ex-movie star becoming president uh, and and therefore knowing very little about the Washington political establishment, and so being forced to staff his administration, to stuff it from stem to stern, with uh, corrupt career apparatchiks. I said, well, that's a pure recipe for disaster. And sure enough, there was an absolute record number of criminal indictments <laughs> that were handed down. The Reagan administration wins over the Grant administration, hands down. Uh, there was no such thing back then as reality TV. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, we're not going to rant. We're going to move straight on. This is the paperback of uh, The Personal Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant. This is by the Belknap Press of Harvard University Press. Norton also does an, edit, an annotated Memoirs of Grant. Uh, and you really uh, benefit by having by having this kind of an approach. I mean, I know there are people on on the one side of the the question about annotated editions who will always say the the text doesn't need it. 
Uh, and then there are people on the other side who say, well, no, the text might not need it. Grant and his editor, Mark Twain, are very good at crafting prose. This is a very good military memoir. It doesn't at all deserve the breathless, absolutely spooging hosannas of praise that is received from armchair readers of military memoirs who, who can list on the fingers of one hand the number of other military memoirs they've read. It doesn't at all deserve that kind of praise. I have seen people in the New Yorker, in the New York Review of Books, with a straight face and no irony, refer to the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant as one of the great American classics of literature. It doesn't in any way deserve those encomiums, but it is still a very interesting thing, and I think it only gets more interesting if you have really good annotations. And the annotations here are by uh, John Marzalek, David Nolan, and Louis Gallo, and they're quite good. Uh, the problem you'll have with, with annotated editions of any kind is that the annotator will feel like they need to earn their keep. <laughs> so that you will, you know, a character will say, I'm going to put this book on the table, and you'll get an annotation describing what a table is. <laughs> it can get a little excessive. Uh, I didn't think it was too bad in this case. Uh, okay, this is a UK trade paperback of Simon Chama. Simon Chama did uh, History of Britain, and this is the first volume from 3000 BC to AD 1603. <laughs> uh, this is the well, uh, the beginning of the world, at the edge of the world, with a question mark. And uh, I got, I've had copies of this of of his books on this the, in this series many times, but I like the UK trade paperback, so I am waiting to find a UK trade paperback of uh, the next volume. Uh, these are Bodley Head. There are two more volumes in this. Volume two and volume three. Uh, I can't. I can't make out what the uh, what the subtitles are of each of them. But they're. Those are my goals. <laughs> those two volumes are my goals because I think this is really good. The, the, uh, Shama and Peter Ackroyd, they they embarked on multi-volume histories, and uh, that can be death unless a person is a good storyteller, and they both are. So. Uh, Oh, okay. All right. Uh, this we get went much, much closer to home. This is Bill Pinney, uh, and this is Chappaquiddick Speaks. And this is a fairly recent book it, that uh, I reviewed for the Martha's Vineyard Gazette. Yes, there's my review tucked inside the book. Uh, of uh, this is a Martha's Vineyard local who studied the the fatal car accident that then Senator Edward Kennedy was in uh, at. At Chappaquiddick, where uh, Mary Jo Kopechny, a young member of his brother's presidential election staff, was in the car with him. They'd both been at a, at a, at a party at, for, until late, late, and uh, the car ended up in the water, upside down, and Kennedy ended up outside of the car. Uh, in his account, frantically trying to open it because Mary Jo Kopechny was still inside and then going to get help. And by the time help arrived, it was too late to save her, she was dead. The facts never lined up with that. Kennedy went back to his hotel and went to sleep. And there, are the, 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 uh, this is the third Kennedy tragedy. This is the one where somebody else died instead of a Kennedy. In the, only, the only Kennedy fatality in this case was Ken Edward Kennedy's political future because the, the incident at Chappaquiddick is the only reason why there was not a second President Kennedy. Uh, is that this hung around, the, the, the suspicion that, that Ted Kennedy simply swam off, walked off and left someone to die could not be shifted. So he never became president and uh, had to deal with this subject for the rest of his life. Uh, and Penny has, he has a complicated theory about what happened. There are all sorts of theories about what happened. Uh, you know, how did Kennedy get out of the car if Mary Jo Kopechny couldn't and they were in the front seat together? How is that possible? Was he maybe not in the car to begin with? Was it intentional? Did she know something and he wanted to kill her? Did, all, all, did he get help to do anything? Did he contact people before he went to his hotel and went to sleep? All that sort of stuff has been dug over exhaustively, and Penny drags, drags it all up again. He has uh, a theory that I think even generously you could, you'd have to call it outlandish as to what happened. Uh, so I, I didn't really read or enjoy the book for that, but I very much liked 
his piecing together, just a forensic piecing together of every single thing we can possibly know about what happened to Chap Quiddick. Uh, I thought that was really well done. Uh, so I was, I was a little leery when I got this from my editor because I thought, oh my god, you know, it's a vineyard, it's a vineyard local, it's a known figure, but what if he's full blown crazy? Then what do I do? You know, a local newspaper is incumbent upon it a great deal of diplomacy that doesn't apply in a bigger regional newspaper or at all in a national newspaper. In a local newspaper, uh, these people can walk into your editor's office, and it's not just a question of you be you you can't lie, of course, but it's it's a different kind of thing. Unless you've written for a small, a very small uh, town newspaper, you might not know what I'm talking about. But it's a it's a tricky thing. When I got it, I thought, oh, that is a tricky thing. What if this is just crazy? I know quite a bit about the Chappaquiddick, what happened to Chappaquiddick. Uh, and I was I was relieved. There there are only a couple of parts of this that are crazy. There are a couple of parts of his theory that's, that, I mean, there's no forensic evidence one way or another, but there are a couple of parts of his theory that just obviously did not happen. Uh, but the bulk of the book was very enjoyable. Belongs on a shelf of Chappaquiddick books. So... Uh, that was a relief. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, this, oh, wow. Okay. Uh, this, <laughs> this is, this is a terrific book. Uh, this doesn't belong in history at all. I'll have to move this because this it makes room for another book. This is Edward Way Teal. I've mentioned Edward Way Teal on this channel before. He, he was a natural history writer, a naturalist uh, in the mid 20th century. He was great. Just fantastic. Never wrote a book that wasn't great. Uh, and this is, uh, he did a series of books uh, where he followed one season throughout a swath of the United States. Where he'd pick summer or winter. Or he, did, he did four books on the seasons and followed them from state to state, from area to area, to see what their different presentations were like, to see what their different stages were like in different latitudes, different parts of the country. Uh, and he condensed that into one book called A Walk Through the Year. Uh, and this uh, this is in, in uh, ratty condition, this trade paperback, but I wouldn't get rid of it for any reason at all <laughs> because this started an avalanche. This started a lot uh, for me. This is a, a walk through the year by Edwin Way Teal. A very lovely trade paperback, but the thing, the reason that I liked it is because somebody who was very opinionated uh, went through and annotated, and they didn't just underline the stuff they liked. They argued with the author and reposted with him and uh a couple of times in this book there's a there's a marginalia that just says says you <laughs> there's a line here in this time of dying lakes and poisoned rivers abused land destroyed wildlife and polluted air we need not only to appreciate nature but to appreciate it enough to join privately in cooperation with groups in protection of what we enjoy and uh this book came out in uh Hang on, bear with me here. This this book came out in uh, uh, 1987. This this one volume came out in 1987, and the the marginality for that line is try it in 10 years later. Totally prescient. Totally right. Uh, uh, and. The the reason that I kept this, I mean, I get I when I when I used to go to the Brattle, I would it says you, <laughs> uh, I, I used to get annotated books at the Brattle all the time. You find them in used bookstores, of course. The reason I kept this one is because it had attitude and because it kept up a working dialogue with the book. And the thing that set in motion, this and a couple of other things, was me wanting to do the same thing. This, this book, believe it or not, as silly as it is, this book was a small but real contributing factor to me wanting to get back into dialoguing with books. And not just in marginalia. One of the things I, one of the thoughts I had when I finished this volume is what a shame it is that no one sees that marginalia but me. It's an audience literally of one. The person was writing it for themselves. They got rid of the book. I got it. I love it. No one else gets to see it until I get rid of it. Uh, and that's, that's not... A conversation that's that's sort of uh i don't even know heckling heckling a vhs tape in the privacy of your own den <laughs> i don't know what it is but it, it it was one of there were a few pebbles that started that avalanche to get me back into talking about books with an audience and that was one of them <laughs> but it doesn't belong here i'm going to put it aside it doesn't belong in nature or in history it belongs somewhere else uh in fact it belongs in a little book room it holds a special place in my heart so it belongs in the little book room uh ah okay uh, okay, this is, uh, 
Elaine Scarry, this is Thermonuclear mon mon Monarchy, choosing between democracy and doom. Look at that cover. Uh, and this is all about thermonuclear weapons. This came out in uh, 2014. I think I wrote about this. I can't remember if, who I reviewed it for, but I thought it was great. Uh, Elaine Scarry wrote The Body in Pain. She also wrote a great, great essay about what happened on 9-11 and how it subverted the norms of, of representative democracy that showed up first in the Boston Review and was then in that year's Best American Essays, and I cannot recommend it strongly enough. It was so good. It's probably online somewhere. It was so good. Controversial. There were a lot of people who disagreed with her points, but I thought it was brilliant. Scathingly furious and brilliant. And this is also sustainedly furious. This is about, you know, what, what on earth is going on here? But there are a handful of countries who have the ability to destroy all life on earth thousands of times over. What on earth is that? Uh, just a, a long and very smart meditation on human, humanity's flirtation with thermonuclear annihilation. It's just terrific. Uh, okay. All right, here we have a different kind of thermonuclear annihilation, a more primitive kind of thermonuclear annihilation. This is Fiona Watson's great book, Under the Hammer, about Edward I and Scotland. And it's, it's uh, a little warped and discolored. See, I'm not even going to get angry that time because that's a funeral escort. Uh, this is uh, warped and discolored because it's one of the few books I have, they're all out here in this room, one of the few books I have that survived an apartment fire that I had years and years ago when I, I had, I had uh, a bunch of beagles and I lived on a third floor of a building and I went out of town. <laughs> I left town. I went on vacation to Washington, D.C. and walked around and had a great time, watched Spider-Man 2 in the movie theater and then came back to a flurry of phone calls that my apartment had burned. And that the people there had been able to save my beagles. They'd been able to get my beagles out onto the sidewalk, but that as far as they knew, nothing else was salvageable. And I got back on a train and went back to Boston. And uh, sure enough, uh, the, it wasn't a, a catastrophic loss, of course, because my boys were safe. But it was the firemen had uh, just turned the hose on the third floor uh, front window blasted it open and just poured water through that window from a hose on the su on the street for an hour. So that, that water was arcing through the air, through the window, and just blasting my biography and history shelf. <laughs> just, just blasting it. And when I got back, somebody had pulled all of that junk off the shelves and put it in one big swamp thing pile of barely recognizable as books anymore. And only a few survived. Only a few things were on the, on the very perimeters and survived the smoke and the water. And this was one of them. It, it was damaged, but not enough so that I can't read it. And I, that's good, because I love it. I, I still uh, agonize over all the stuff that I did lose in that fire. I, I, I lost my, for instance, my iMac. Do you remember the iMacs? The, those those uh, portable little pod computers, desktop computers that, Mar that Apple made, where you could see inside them. They were transparent. I had one of those. <laughs> I, had a, I had a book manuscript in progress that was destroyed. Uh, a number of things. A number of things were destroyed, including lots and lots of books. So, you know, you, when that happens, you're always, forever afterwards, going to be mentally trying to get that all back. It's not going to happen and, if, uh, uh, stupidly. I kept an inventory of my books. I kept a written, a handwritten inventory, and I would always tell myself when I was updating it, well, this is in case there's ever a fire, God forbid, or you lose anything like this. And where was the inventory? It was on a book on the shelf with those books. <laughs> it was destroyed right along with them. So I don't know what was lost. Uh, but anyway, the book was <laughs> the book. The book is really good. The book is really good. Not there aren't many uh, uh, detailed studies of the reign of Edward the First of the actual specifics, the actual you know uh, details from month to month for the popular audiences I would wish and so I grab them when I get when I see them um, uh, okay uh, this is by Thomas Madden this is Enrico Dandolo and the rise of Venice uh, terrific terrific book from John the Johns Hopkins University Press I, this is the uh, trade paperback but I don't think I'm blurbed on this I don't think this came out I think in 2008 oh no 2003 okay so I wouldn't have been blurbed I didn't I don't think I reviewed this at all I could swear that I did though uh, maybe it was another Enrico Dandolo book. He's, he's a pivotal figure. You don't know his name. But he, he's, a, he's a pivotal figure in, in Venetian history. Uh, and this is just terrific. This is... Uh, 
this is all about Dandolo's rule and about all the, all the stuff that went on that transformed the nature of Venetian society under his rule. Uh, okay, all right, this is uh, Patricia Fortini Brown. I don't know why I have this. Why do I have this? Uh, this is uh, not an uncommon thing at all. This is art and life in Renaissance Venice. Uh, it's one of you know three hundred books like this. I mean, I kept this one. I don't I don't quite know why. I would think that I would have kept one. I mean, there there have been many 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 books like this. One time or another, I've had them all. And you'd think I would think that if I wanted to keep a book on this subject, I would keep the biggest one, the most detailed one. So I'm not really sure why I kept what is obviously an undergraduate trot. Uh, let me put, this, put that aside and figure out. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, no more Venice. Now we move on to uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. This is the George Wilson Pearson uh, study of democracy in America. De Tocqueville wrote a book called Democracy in America that I just reread last year. Uh, can't recommend it highly enough. If you haven't read it and you're an American, you really should. Uh, and it, it's, uh, oddly enough, a foundational document, even though it was written by a foreigner. Uh, and this is a Pearson's study of it, just an enormously detailed textual study of it, called Tocqueville in America. Big, thick thing uh, from the University of Chicago Press. No, this is Johns Hopkins again, and uh, this is just terrific. Uh, it stands the test of time. It, people, I've heard Carper say that it doesn't, but it most certainly does. And uh, you can have the, uh, there's a big uh, University Press annotated edition of the Democracy in America, and you can have the Penguin, Cla Penguin Classics does a very pretty Democracy in America. That's the one I reread uh, because de Tocqueville really doesn't need annotation. He's another one of those authors who really doesn't. You benefit by it, but he will carry you along even if you don't have it. Uh, but even if you have those two things, the, the Penguin and I think it was the University of Chicago, I want to say that about the big Democracy in America, you still have to have the Pearson as a study, as a companion study. If your de Tocqueville shelf only has four books on it, <laughs> then it's got to have uh, the Penguin. It's got to have that big annotated academic press Democracy in America. It's got to have De Tocqueville in America, and it's got to have Hugh Brogan's biography of De Tocqueville. Uh, at least those four. <laughs> I, I'm a bit of a fan of the guy, though, so I might be going overboard. You really only need just the text. Uh, ah, okay, all right. We saw this. Uh, we saw this already on this channel. I, it's a sweet tooth subject of mine. Otherwise, I don't think I would keep this book. Uh, this is C. David Heyman's book, The Georgetown Lady Social Club, and it is about five. I mean, it, it encompasses dozens, but it's about it's mainly about five examples of that weird taxonomic group, <laughs> the uh, the Washington socialite, the the ladies of Washington, the first ladies of Washington, uh, who didn't hold any elective office. They were the ones that kept the social wheels running in Georgetown and and Silver Spring and a whole bunch of other places for 150, 170 years. The 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 deals were made, the wheels were greased, the friendships were repaired, the groundwork was laid for a whole bunch of famous stuff that makes it into the history books. For 170 years, that was all done, overseen by a cadre of these particular women. They were smarter than any of the men. They knew the politics of their day better than any of the men did. They knew who was weak and who was strong. They knew how to put the right people in the right room together, and it was an amazing thing, and it really deserves... I've said this a couple of times on this channel. I have memoirs from memoirs and, and period histories from a lot of these women. Uh, and I've, I've said all along, uh, many times on this channel, that it really deserves a big book. Not this. This is a gossip fest. Interesting. If you know all, I know, I know a lot about all the people involved, especially a couple of them. Uh, so I was not going to be able to resist a book like this, but it doesn't have much in the way of historical probity. It, it, the author never passes up a juicy story even if he's got it from, you know, the vicious enemy of its subject. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, he doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't corroborate anything, and he's also kind of breathless. And that's a shame, because the subject is actually important and deserves uh, a better, so better treatment than this. If it had one, and I just don't know about it, feel free to let me know. Uh, <clears throat> okay. All right, this next one is Vincent Pugliosi, who will be, is, is infamous on this channel for having written one of the longest books ever written, Reclaiming History, which is his... 15, 1700 page book about the not just the Kennedy assassination the John, John F. Kennedy assassination but also all of the theories is explaining that assassination he, do, he not only describes the assassination but he goes into every one of the theories and debunks them all he's a Warren report affirmer, he supports the Warren report Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone um, 
And the book is enormous. It's too big to hold. It's too big to carry. It's too big to read. You have to lay it flat, not on a piece of, on a table or a chair, but flat on the floor. And it should be a, a flagstone floor. Because even a, even a wooden floor will be in danger. <laughs> and so you have to lay it flat on the floor and then lay yourself flat on the floor and read it that way. And it, as if that weren't bad enough, it doubles its length with the CD in the back, which is all of the author's notes, some of which run to two or 300 pages. So it is, I would, I'm, I'm fairly confident in saying that it is one of, if not the longest book ever written. And I read it twice, including the notes, and reviewed it. <laughs> uh, and this book, this next book is not Reclaiming History. Of course, Reclaiming History is in the little book room. This is a much, much shorter book that, Bibli that Bugliosi wrote. This is a very interesting thing uh, called the, the Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder. And this is Bugliosi laying out a prosecutor's case that George W. Bush took the country to war on what he knew were false pretenses and that he's therefore guilty of murder of everyone who died as a result. And... Uh, I, <laughs> It's done with a very great amount of anger, a very great amount of zeal. The, the anger, I think, blinds Bugliosi to the fact that as a defense attorney, he would have ripped this to shreds. Instead, he very often in this book says that this is a lay-down, flat, incontrovertible black-letter law case, that there is no arguing against it, when Bugliosi on the other side of the courtroom would have found plenty to argue with, but it's still absolutely invigorating. And it's going to feel like ancient history to a lot of people, but... Uh, the wars are still going on, so, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I'm a, I admit I'm a kind of a fan of Bugliosi's uh, pugnacious style, his rhetorical style. I don't like any of the uh, stupid pretensions that go along with it. He brags, he never stops bragging, he never misses an opportunity to tell people that he writes all of his books in longhand on legal, yellow legal pads, one page after another in longhand, indecipherable longhand, one page after another. Don't have a computer, don't know how to set my own watch. Or, or, or right and long here. Like, there's no virtue in that. That is a stupid bit of pretension. Just a stupid bit of pretension. It's like putting on some sort of suede jacket to write. I don't know if Bugliosi is dumb enough to brag about that, but he never stops bragging about writing these things in the least efficient way possible. I, I don't know that he would get approving dude bro nods from his audiences in, in Georgetown if he said, oh, oh I, I don't uh, deal with the, the modern technology of paper. I, I chisel all of my books in stone, uh, and then I leave it to my assistants to, uh, to, uh, to, uh... I think an audience would start to titter with laughter if he said that. Well, it's no different to say that you write all, that you wrote a 1,500-page book on legal pads by longhand. That shows that you're insane. That doesn't show... <laughs> anyway, uh, that, all of that fault or all notwithstanding, I love the finished product. I, I don't think he's ever written a book that I didn't love. Um, although I think uh, The Prosecution of George W. Bush for Murder and Reclaiming History are the only ones I have. I don't think I have his famous book on Charles Manson. Uh, ah, okay, all right. Uh, this is fantastic. This is, uh, I, I always gripe on this channel about how serious Tudor history is usually written for academics, by academics, and is in the background, and that usually what you get at the front of the shop for Tudor history is the most salacious nonsense and garbage in the world. Just an endless stream of books about the wives. <laughs> about the wives. If I never read another book about the wives, as long as I live, I will be content. <laughs> so, so when I get serious studies of, of uh, Tudor politics, which is they are possible to do. We have plenty of documents. You could do serious books on the Tudors from now on. Uh, when I get them, I love them, and I keep them. And this is one of them. This is by Lauren McKay, and this is Among the Wolves at Court. And this is the story of uh, Thomas and George Boleyn, the brother and the father of Anne Boleyn. And, and uh, you know, her story flits through these pages, definitely, but this is a story of what it was like to be uh, a climber, an ambitious courtier in the, in the, at the court of Henry VIII, what it was like to do that. And uh, to the extent that the author tries to rehabilitate uh, Thomas and especially George, uh, she kind of lost me uh, because I don't think that's possible. Just because, uh, just because your subjects have been described and dramatically portrayed as venal monsters uh, in the popular press and in you know on film and TV and whatnot, doesn't mean that they weren't in fact venal monsters. It could be that both those things are true. And in this case, I think it's not controvertible. I think it's easily establishable that that is, that they were just horrible, horrible people. 
to so to the extent she tries to rehabilitate them, she kind of loses me. But to the extent that she investigates their lives, oh, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Also wonderful on the women in the Bolin family, not just Anne and not just Anne's sister, the other Bolin girl, but the women, the the mother of Anne Bolin and Mary Bolin was a remarkable figure in her own right. And they get lots of attention in, in, uh, among the wolves at court. So I strongly recommend it if you're looking for that sort of thing. And maybe you're sick of the wives too. Uh, okay. Uh, this is by GPV Akrig. This is Jacobean Pageant, the court of King James I. A nice old hardcover that I, that I revivified. Uh, and this is just a gallery of famous people from, from the court of King James I. It, uh, Akrig uh, partakes a little too much of the uh, the standard propaganda about James the first himself the, the most of most of what you read in the popular press the books didn't get any more popular than this one I think this was a book of the month club it was it sold like crazy when it came out uh, 70 years ago when did this come out 1962 uh, it sold like crazy when it came out it was really really popular uh, but most of the those uh, accounts of James are fairly easy a big-lipped blubber, a, a page-groping nincompoop, that sort of thing. And most of that sort of thing was created by his political opponents, sometimes long after the fact. Uh, so that's to be taken, to put it mildly, with, with a grain of salt. I mean, there were, most of that stuff has, stands on very shaking foundations. But everybody else, I mean, the, pe the portrait of James I in here is really good, really entertaining, just to take it with a grain of salt. And everybody else in here has done wonderfully. Just done wonderfully. A Craig can really, really write. Uh, uh, okay. All right, this next person can also really, really write. <laughs> I have everything of his that I ever find. Uh, I've never gone online to do a buying binge. I know some people do that with, with authors that they like, but I, I worry what would happen to my budget and to my shelves if I did that. But this is David Kennedy. I think he's fantastic. I have a number of books of his. This is one of his called Aspects of Aristocracy, Grandeur and Decline in Modern Britain. And this is all about uh, the British noble families in, 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 and the approach of modernity and the approach of the modern world. <laughs> and, uh, and it's great. He has a knack for writing about this world. So it's, uh, it's fantastic. I, I, I admit that this particular book might be a little thin for someone who's not a Kennedy fan. Uh, but I am. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. I can't get enough of this subject. Although I'm noticing now, I'm, I'm realizing now, uh, that uh, the greatest book on this subject uh, I don't appear to have. Can that possibly be true? The, the decline and fall of the British aristocracy? I, I don't recall seeing it on this library tour. Oh my god, I hope it's in the little book room. I hope I don't not have a copy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, this is still a really good study. Uh, uh, lacks a, it lacks a kind of narrative overview. It's much more this person, that person, this person, but still interesting. Uh, uh, okay, and then we finish up with uh, a book for Caleb. <laughs> uh, this is Peter Parker's book, Houseman Country. Uh, a study of uh, A. Houseman and also a, a biography of him, really. It works functionally as a biography of him and also a study of his poetry and the ethos behind bucolic poetry of the time uh, that I... It sounded fascinating to me. I became aware of the book mainly because it was it had a flurry of reviews uh, in the UK press, in the UK book press, the book chat world of the UK. Uh, and I thought, boy, that sounds really interesting. I should see if there's a copy on Book Outlet or whatnot, a book depository, because I thought it'll never get an American publisher. And it did. <laughs> so, so, and then I got a flurry of reviews here as well. I think mainly it just uh, uh, talked into how well it was done how utterly thoughtful it was. I, I don't have any idea how many... I'd be, I'd be willing to bet that every single person who read Houseman Country had the same reaction that I did, which was to immediately go to their Houseman, pull their Houseman off the shelf, and just spend some time with the poet himself. Uh, but I loved it. Very odd book. Not sure that it belongs here. It probably belongs over in the biography section, but we're not going back there. <laughs> we, are, we are plowing ahead with history. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, book two.